Hi, everybody. And yes, I, was, I would have liked to speak about biology, but instead I'm going to speak about education, which is my other passion. So first of all, a bit of history. I was the first machine learning hire into Stanford's computer science department. That was well over 30 years ago, and so I've been teaching for most of my life. <laughs> I had the privilege of teaching Greg, I had the privilege of teaching Sam Altman, and so I trained a lot of really amazing machine learning people, and I'm very proud of that. Um, so, um, what then happened when we decided to launch Coursera was, to me, was the impetus that, you know, the kind of one-size-fits-all education that we were offering as part of our large lecture classes, which were, you know, 100, 200, 300 people and continue to grow. My daughter is now at Berkeley. Her data science class has 3,000 people in it, which is insane. So how do we actually offer a personalized experience that actually gets people to learn something that's truly meaningful? And, um, you know, we've heard several times about Bloom's Law and about how we can get all of the, how if we can actually offer personalized education, we can get people to be in the upper half of the distribution. Turns out someone actually already did that experiment. He was called Bloom. He did that experiment about 50 years ago. And there's this thing called Bloom's Law that shows that if you do actually offer a personalized education to even the less um, successful students at the beginning, they are two standard deviations away from the mean. So this is called Bloom's Two Sigma Law. And just for those of you who don't remember your Gaussian distributions, the two standard deviations means you're in the top 5%. Not the top half, but the top 5% of the distribution. So imagine what if everyone was actually at the top 5% of the distribution because we could offer them a personalized learning experience. And that was actually part of the vision behind Coursera. And we succeeded in some ways, but we didn't in others. So what does it take to really offer a high quality educational experience to people? The first is just content. The content has to be of high quality, there has to be variety there, it has to be in digestible units that people can absorb, um, it has to span different languages, different backgrounds, different interests, and with that I think we actually did a pretty good job at Coursera. We had a lot of very, very high quality content. By the way, quality in the generative AI models is still something that we still struggle with, as we all know when we talk about hallucination, but we'll figure that out. The second thing that is, I think, is equally or maybe even more important is personalization. How do we get people to engage with the content because it's something that they truly care about because it is aligned with their interests, their background, their passions? Um, and how do we give them the opportunity to kind of follow a path that aligns with that curiosity-driven thing that is what really gets people to learn and retain content? And that is actually much, much harder to do, and we certainly didn't get that right in Coursera because you, didn't, you weren't able to create those magical paths with the kind of video content that we had. And I would say that that ability to follow a unique individualized path is only becoming more important in the world that we are at today because the really interesting things do not lie in the core of any single discipline. They typically lie at the boundary of one, two, three, four disciplines. And so how do we get people to kind of create their unique synthetic path? That's where I think the really great inventions are typically going to come from. So that's the second one was personalization and the synthesis across disciplines. But now we're getting to the really hard stuff, the stuff that I think generally AI still has a way to go. Um, the, so number three on my list would be the um, modeling of the mind. Um, so a really good tutor understands what it is that their students do not understand. And they're able to figure that out and create an explanation that is tailored to the lack of comprehension of an individual student. And I think for that, um, we need to actually create systems that are trained using reinforcement learning uh, on not just um, any old people, but you know, students who are in the process of learning because that's what really good tutors do. They kind of understand and they learn to understand where the common misconceptions the common failures of understanding are, and I think that's a really great challenge for, um, for you know, the current AI systems. And then finally, and I think that one's a 
really interesting one, um, which is the value of human engagement. We all know the difference between going to the gym on our own, even with the best exercise videos, and going when there's a personalized human trainer who's there, or going even with a friend and to whom we feel accountable and beholden to kind of hold up our own. And so I think that's a question of at what point will we believe that our AI systems are a replacement for a human, or do we still need to have a human teacher involved, at least in some ways, in the learning process or a human friend, because ultimately learning is, for many people, a social endeavor. And so I think that's a really interesting exercise. And I'm out of time.